Good morning. It's good to have everybody here. And we're going to start our sermon off that Cub is going to bring us, bring to us with a scripture reading from the book of Acts. And it's going to be the 17th chapter of Acts, verses 24 through 31. You got it, Cub? Okay. Flipping back there. <laughs> All right. Acts 17, starting in 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the earth, or live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries for their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel the way towards him and find him. Yet he is not actually far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being as even some of our own poem, poems have said, poets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. Continuing in 29. Being the Lord's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine, we not ought to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of man. The times of ignorance, ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in, his right, in righteousness by a man who he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Thank you. Well, I just want to put out a warning to Nick and the likes of him. If you're waiting on Cub, you're walking backwards, right? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, great job, Nick. Reading the scripture, that's uh, uh, the magnitude of what we're going to talk about this morning. That our God is not something from our imagination. It's not something that came from our thought. It's not our ideas, but it's God's plan. And so today I want to welcome you uh, to a great opportunity to come and worship God. We're grateful for our visitors. We're grateful you're here, but I don't like the word visitor. Uh, you are now an honored guest. We love having you, and we look forward to your return at our next appointed time. And I'm reading some eyes there, and you're going, when is that, Cub? And I'm glad you asked. It's 6 o'clock this evening. We'll get together for another portion of God's Word to celebrate on this great day. A day the Lord has made, uh, 118 Psalm, verse 24. A day that we can rejoice and be glad in. I want to lighten the mood, if you will. I have some great discoveries. I want to ask some questions with don't need responses to. Like Charlie the song leader, right? What, I, I want to ask you, you know, uh, quick off the cuff, you know, what did the guests at the Eskimo holiday party sing? What song was it? For he's a jolly good fellow. For he's a jolly good fellow. Never mind. I have a question for Justin, too. You know? <laughs> Why is this holiday just like any other day at the office? You don't have to answer it. I'll give you the answer. It's simple. You do all the work and the fat man in the suit gets all the credit. <laughs> I have a question for you scholars. Uh, you college age group. 
We have a great month, December. What in December do we have that we don't get in any other month? The letter D. I'm here all week, folks. But I really said that for a reason. Because I want to make a point. You could very easily tell not much work went into those jokes. But how much work went into God bringing salvation to mankind? You know, there was a great decree sent by a king that they're going to take a census. And so these two individuals took off and went to their area that they needed to be in. Joseph was uh, from the descendant of David. So he needed to go to Bethlehem for this census. Now, they're in Nazareth. Now, I know we read the Bible and they, we, we get in there. Well, that took about two minutes to read that. And he's already in Bethlehem. Folks, it's 80 miles. There was a lot of work. A lot of effort. To see that God did this. This wasn't man's doing. You know, God uses man as an agent to fulfill his will. This is something that we learn as we study and we learn and we grow. And so all this didn't just happen. This was God's eternal plan. And I would say from day one, but that would stop it from being eternity. Because there is no day one in eternity. Jesus said, I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I am the alpha, I'm the omega. There is no beginning. There is no end to eternity. The eternal plan of God. And, and think about that. Th this was done and, and prophesied way back in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 that this was going to take place. Over 900 years before it happened. The great and powerful God that we serve saw fit to make sure that prophecy was fulfilled. I said all that because, folks, I don't want us to belittle this great plan. I don't want us to limit anything to one day. It's more than that. It's so much more. Caitlin, you're lucky I didn't see you. You were hiding. I'll get you. See, we're talking about faith. See, faith unwraps that gift of salvation. God's gift to the world was that he would bring salvation to mankind. Titus chapter 2 says that grace has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Not every man will be saved. But every man has an opportunity to know Christ, to be saved. And in that great gift that God sent, I want us to unwrap. You remember the Bible says that he was in swaddling clothes? That's unwrapping. Because we can't leave him in that manger. We can't leave him like a little Tickle Me Elmo doll and, oh, cuckoo, how beautiful the baby is. Let's go back to our original life now. Let's not leave him there. Let's look at his name. Let's unwrap it. What does his name mean? What is it about? His person. Who he is. This great savior. This great king. A kingdom. And all these play part in God's plan. Because God gives man an opportunity to know him in a covenant way. And the covenant comes through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when we look at that, when we understand this name, Jesus, it'll help us to understand how great our God is. You know, Jesus took on, God took on flesh, and he did it through a fleshly way. That's, that's, that's how he went through the birthing canal, the birthing process, so that he, he could identify with you and I. 
And he did that with the name. And, and he told him, you will call him Jesus. Right? If we look in our passage, Luke chapter 1. Let's look at verse uh, 31 through 33. Luke chapter 1 says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Now, we have to understand, Jesus was a very common name in that part of the country or at this time especially. It was, it was, it was not uh, something peculiar, something different. And behold, you'll call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Now that's a little different. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, fulfilling prophecy. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Dive into that name, his name. John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God who brings forgiveness of our sins. Now, I don't know what you've been taught, but I know what the Bible says about salvation. Salvation is forgiveness of our sins. Now, if you're looking for Cub's salvation, you might come and apologize to Cub, Cub forgive you, you got Cub's salvation. But we ain't looking for Cub's salvation. We're looking for God's salvation. So we need to understand what it is that God requires for that forgiveness to bring that salvation. Titus uh, chapter 2, again, says he brought grace, brought, appeared, and brought salvation, teaching us to deny ungodliness. And yet we live in a world that sees the cuckoo and the goo-goo and the gaga baby, but they forget to learn from him. That he is the Savior, the Lamb of God, He's a prophet, a prophet that was talked about way back in the Old Testament. Moses himself, if you remember, in Acts chapter 3, and we look at verses 22 through 23. It says, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you, and it will be that every soul that does not heed the prophet will be utterly destroyed from among the people. What's in a name? In the Greek, when you see the word name, it carries with it much more of the connotation that what, what we consider the name. Like the name Noah labels you, we get, you know you, Noah, because that's your name. But when we see the name Jesus, it's more than just a name. It's a name that is above all names, Philippians chapter 2. The name Jesus is above all names? Well, then all these, no, no, no. It's not the name. It's the cause. It's the purpose. It's everything Jesus is about. It's a knee, according to that same passage, that will have every knee bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of our God. A knee that bows when we heed his authority. Now, we know a prophet is something special, um, something that was in, in the Bible. But they had a duty, they had an opportunity to preach the will of God. That's what Jesus did. He said, I, I came, to, I, didn't, I don't speak on my own initiative, but the one who sent me. I'm a prophet. I don't speak my own ideas. I speak what God has sent me to speak. Sometimes that would involve forecasting the future. The book of Revelation was spoken by Jesus to John. Some events had taken place. Some were still in the future back then. But they hadn't happened yet. And so Jesus had that problem. In, 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 in Revelation chapter 1, it says, Blessed is he who reads, hears, and heeds the words of this book. 
Jesus, that name includes being that prophet. He's a priest. Turn in your Bibles with me. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's look at verse 14. Charlie Autry did a good job in this verse throughout his teaching of the book of Hebrews. We were blessed to have Charlie. Grateful Charlie is with us today in the sound room. So if you don't like hearing me, blame Charlie. 14 says, therefore, since we have a great high priest, what do we have? A great high priest. This Jesus, the name is a high priest who passed through the heavens. Jesus, who? Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. Let us heed what we say. He's that priest. And what does a priest do? Well, a priest offers sacrifice. It's kind of the go-between of God and man. And I had a man tell me one time, Jesus came to plead God's case to man. He ascended to plead man's case to God. Jesus is our high priest. He's our advocate. He is our, the one that loves us and, and, and wants us to be right. And he's made that sacrifice that, that our sins could be forgiven through that blood, through that great sacrifice that was made. We could be part of this covenant relationship with God by allowing his priesthood to reign in our life. And because the reign is there, he, 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 he's, he's king. This Jesus, he's not just a baby in, in, in a manger that we come to visit once a year and celebrate. We celebrate him every day of our life because people, he's our king. And now that, that carries with it a great connotation. If you go over to Revelation chapter 17, look at verse 14. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. These will wage war against the Lamb. Easy life, isn't it? Wage war against the Lamb. And the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of lords and what? King of kings. There is nobody in this world of higher authority than Jesus Christ. And those who are with Him are the called, the chosen, and the faithful, the church. Because, folks, we have unwrapped Jesus and seen him for who he truly is. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Heed it. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus came to bring God to us so that we could find that salvation that is offered through this name, this name. Jesus. You know, the physicist and astronomer Galileo Galilei said, all truths are easy to understand once they're discovered. The point is to discover them. You know, the world is celebrating a baby in a manger today. We, as the church, celebrate the name Jesus. Everything about Jesus every day of our lives. I don't want us to leave Jesus undiscovered. There's a whole book written about him. It's called the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it's about Jesus. If you want to know Jesus, he makes himself available. What you need to do is whoosh, unwrap him. See him for he truly is that great name we call Jesus. And that name, Jesus, is also a quality of a person. Folks, he's the son of God. You know, again, he's not a little doll. Something that, you know, a doll that we set out there in the front of uh, our houses and, you know, once a year and, and, and call ourselves Christians because we do that. 
He's God's son. Now, to us, that really doesn't make much sense. But again, when we read the Bible, we have to understand this was written to people that, that you know, a long time ago, but, but, but understood this a little bit deeper than we do. A son of God means that he is of God himself. Not an imitation of God, the exact representation of God. God in the flesh. He is the son of God. And that's important because we have to understand that. I want us to turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Now, I know what the words are and, and they're great, but when you dig in, you're seeing something happen here. That this, through Isaiah's prophecy, said, God is coming to earth. A son. A child will be born, the natural process, a son. You remember back in the days, a son was important because what did sons do? They carried on the name. Jesus is sent, God is sending Jesus to carry on his name. And we're going to talk about that. A son is sent to us, the Bible says, and the government will rest on his shoulders. People, he's not talking about our government. He's talking about church. He's talking about people that have faith in God. The government of God is going to rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, you look at those words. Those are great words. But what do they mean? Well, he's a great God. Great in the sense that he is God. Great in the sense that he's a wonderful counselor. Now I tell you, I've watched people go blow their money on counselors and really get nothing out of it. This is, this is the, uh, a wonderful counselor. Now, when you look at this word, we have to understand wonderful and counselor to understand wonderful counselor. Wonderful means what he says is firm. It don't change. God's the same today, the same yesterday, the same forever. He doesn't change. It is Firm and his counseling, that is a, a word that means lead us away from the judgment. <laughs> a counselor that is firm, and yes, Daniel, he's going to lead us away from judgment. His judgment is firm, but he's going to lead us out of that. Oh, wonderful counselor takes on a whole new name, a whole new idea that I get to follow him. He's great as the mighty God. And we have to understand that word because when that word was written in the Old Testament by the scribes, they had to go through a whole cleaning process, a purification process before they could even write the word. And we have the audacity to come in and say, God, you're lucky I'm here. This is an almighty God. They would have to change their clothes, bathe, change their pen, cleanse their hands purify everything, sit down, write the word God or Elo. Put the pen down, rebathe, reclothe, recleanse, come back and continue writing. Now, do you know how many times the word God is used in the Old Testament? Could you imagine the process? Do you think there was great work being done to make sure that you and I have the proper and accurate account of who God is? Yeah. This one that was born in Bethlehem is God himself coming in the flesh so that you and I could know, not just know of, but identify with our creator. That, that's amazing to me. Almost as amazing as those jokes I told him. A little bit, a little bit more than that. He's great as the mighty God. He's great as the eternal father. Look at God called him the eternal father. Now I'm going to tell you there's a whole religious or organization out there priding themselves on their fact that Jesus is not God. In the book of John, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you're going to die in your sins. Unless you believe 
that he is God, then you're going to die in your sins. God is very clearly, very plainly, very precisely pointed him out as the eternal father. Now, we have to understand why God said that. He is the eternal strength that is going to keep his church together. He is going to be the binding fact, the binding love that keeps his church together. The strength, the almighty God. And when we looked at that word, uh, in, at the almighty God, way back over there, go back over here, because we, we, I didn't want to skip this point. I want us to go back to um, Isaiah 11. And I want us to see this. I lay, Isaiah 11. No, no, no. Isaiah chapter 9. My bad. Let's go over there. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. If you look up at verse 4, it says, For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders. You're going to break them free. This great God, this Jesus, is going to break us free from that burden, from that yoke upon their shoulders. The rod of their oppressors as at the battle of Midian. Jesus is going to come and fight that battle and win for us. He's going to fight the battle of sin, conquer it. He's going to fight the battle of the grave. The grave, remember, we don't fear the grave because we are going to be in the grave. We are not, it's conquered. And sin, where is your victory? Jesus conquered those for us because he is the almighty God, the eternal father, the strength of what puts us all together that keeps us united under his name, loving each other and caring for each other each and every day. And he's great as the prince of peace. A prince is a ruler. And he rules peace. Remember in John chapter 14, peace I leave with you. Not the world's peace, but my peace. The peace that I rule. The peace that I give you this covenant relationship with God. A peace. And when we look at that word peace, the ruler, it means like the um, authority to turn our head to what we look for or toward when we look for authority. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on the earth. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 28. So folks, he's the prince of peace. Our heads should be pointed towards him, looking at him, focusing on him, Hebrews chapter 12. Good news for the world or bad news. Man went in the doctor's office and the doctor told him, I have good news and I got bad news. He said, the good news is you're not a hypochondriac. That's what I thought too. We have bad news, folks. We live in the flesh. The good news is God came to save us. God, the eternal Father, came to this world to save us. Came as the Son of God to conquer our, our problems and our fears that we can have eternal life with him in, in heaven. Now, we know the Bible says that he was born in Bethlehem, but the question is, has he been born in you? See, that's where we miss that rubber meat in the road part. Because when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about salvation, we're talking about a kingdom. A kingdom where he reigns. As Luke recorded for us there in verse 30, 33, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Folks, get this thought out of your mind that he's coming back to reign. He's already reigning. He's already established his kingdom. He's not coming back to establish the kingdom. It's been established. And he is reigning over the house of Jacob forever, Luke writes. And his kingdom will have no end. What a powerful statement. God prophesied this. He told us back in the, uh, Isaiah, go back over there in Isaiah chapter 11 and look at, at this passage because in it is, is, is a great 
idea of how much God loves us. Prophesied this. Verses 1 and 2 says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. There's the prophecy. Isaiah 53 calls him that shoot. Parched by the world, kicked to the curb, yet reigning in this world. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. That's the church. Woo That's us. You didn't know that, did you? Way back in Isaiah chapter 11. Andrea, he, you were written about right there. You're the fruit. I didn't call you a fruit loop. Don't get me wrong. But you're the fruit of God's kingdom. Prophesied about. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Folks, let's break that down. That God's spirit will rest on him. Remember, when Jesus was baptized, what happened? Ooh, dove didn't just sit and fly. It rested upon him to fulfill the prophecy that was talked about. Now, that being said, was, what, what, is, what is you getting, what, what is it that Isaiah is trying to get across to us? Well, he's going to be of a unique, a peculiar nature, folks. He's going to rest on him to guide, and it's the fulfillment of the prophecy in, at his baptism where the Spirit, like a dove, rested upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. What, what, what you're reading is, he will have the skill, wisdom, to teach us how to keep God's seed, God's family, upon this earth. That's wisdom and understanding. He, this Jesus, is going to teach us how to keep God's family, God's church, God's seed, growing upon this earth. Counsel and strength. He knows God's way, right? And he teaches it through the truth how to avoid the judgment that's coming. Are we hearing that? Jesus is trying to keep us from judgment. I've heard people all the time, I read the book of Revelation and I get scared. Uh, that, that's a scary book. I said, not for me. I'm a Christian. When I read the book of Revelation, I get two words. We win. That's what you should get from the book of Revelation. There's two people in the book of Revelation. You know it. We say it all the time. There's those who dwell on the earth and those who overcome. We're the overcomers because we listen to the counsel and we live by his strength. We walk with Jesus each and every day. And then the great one, the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He comes to teach us the reverence that we should have for God. Fear, yes, but it's the idea of love and respect and homage that we pay to this great God. That's what he came to teach us because our king loves us. I want us to continue 11, Isaiah 11. Look at verses 3 and 4. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord and he will not judge by what his eyes see. Look at, look at, grab a hold of this, people. Nor make a decision by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. That's authority. That's discipline. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. With the breath of his lips, God breathed word, inspired word of God, breathing life into us. And as we live, the wicked are cast down. Judgment has already come to the earth. John chapter 3. God has come to establish a kingdom. A kingdom of people that love God, fear God, trust God, and obey God. He's not going to judge on the outside, but he's going to judge from the inside. He's going to not only know that we do it, but he's going to know why we do it. And folks, he's reigning today. If he wasn't reigning, there wouldn't be a church. He reigns today. He reigns in you. He reigns in me. He's God himself. 
what we've done today. Now, I'll tell you what, tomorrow there's going to be a lot of unwrapping going on, yeah? And there's nothing wrong with families getting together and having a great time fellowshipping one another and sharing the great joy of, 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 of sharing these things. But, Father, people, let's not leave Jesus wrapped up. We did that today. We unwrapped Jesus and his true identity because Jesus is more than a season to come. He's a reason to become. I want to encourage you. You know, don't get caught up in the world's idea of a pageantry and then forget how beautiful our God is. Believe in who he is. Believe in his being. Believe in more than a season. Believe in the reason. Believe in who he is. Believe in his power. He is God. He's almighty. There is nothing you're facing today that he cannot, will not, and shall not conquer. Oh, you say, but Cub, what about death? Oh, he did. He conquers death. And he reigns today. Believe in that reign. You know, when you were baptized, you made a confession that Jesus is Lord. What you said is he's going to reign in my life. I want to encourage you today, if you've not made that confession, I pray you'll make that confession today. Because Jesus, as your king, brings you into eternal life. We want that for you. We as his kingdom want that for you. Because we, as we've talked about, this is the way that you are led out of judgment and into the bosom of Abraham. If you're here and you've obeyed the gospel, remember how special Jesus is. Don't ever for a minute take him for granted. God sent his only begotten son to this world that if we'll believe in him, we'll always have the opportunity of eternal life. And Satan doesn't like that. So he tries to throw stuff at us, to get us confused, to belittle our faith to a manger, to belittle our faith to a season, to try to confuse us and take us away from God. But we as a church will strengthen each other. That's what we're here for. If you need strengthening in your faith, in your love, in your forgiveness, whatever it is that you're struggling in, God will strengthen you today if you'll let him. He'll wash away your sins today if you'll let him. Today's your opportunity to let us help. Take this opportunity right now to come forward as we stand and we sing.